In this unit, we're going to begin our discussion of ecology, the topic of ecology. And this is really one of my favorite units because it really explains how organisms interact with each other and with their environment. And, and really, we can kind of get an understanding of how things work in the environments and why things um, occur the way that they do. Uh, ecology really looks at and explains a lot of that, which I find very interesting, and I hope you will as well, uh, during our discussion of ecology. So if we wanted to define that, it would be the study of living things and their interaction in their particular environment, both with living and non-living things. And so the first part of this is we're just going to get some basic definitions here of some different things. And the first is an autotroph. And an autotroph is anything that's able to produce or synthesize their own uh, organic molecules, essentially sugars or energy, um, from simple inorganic substances. Some things that do this, plants, um, uh, photosynthetic bacteria and algae are, are labeled autotrophs because they're able to produce their own uh, organic molecules. Heterotrophs are organisms that obtain their organic material or molecules from other organisms, so they have to do this by eating different things. And there can be multiple levels of heterotrophs. Um, there can be primary uh, consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers. Uh, we can label things as herbivores, we can label things as omnivores, we can label organisms as carnivores. Um, and a consumer is essentially just anything that does consume other organisms in order to obtain organic matter. And that might be something that's living or has recently been killed. Um, to further discuss energy and organisms a little bit, a consumer is an organism that ingests other organic matter that is living or recently killed. Uh, a good example would be a great white shark eating a seal. Um, a herbivore... Uh, excuse me, a detri detrivore is an organism that ingests dead organic matter. Um, and these are really important because they help to break down and release nutrients back into the ecosystem. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute here. Uh, and a good example of this one is an earthworm. Uh, these guys, uh, saptrophs, excuse me, are organisms that live uh, on or in or dead organic matter. And they uh, secrete digestive enzymes. Um, that basically break things down, uh, dead things down, in order to absorb the products of that digestion. Um, and so, looking at all of this, we can organize life into kind of two different categories. Something that is biotic, or living organisms, and abiotic. And those are the physical, environmental characteristics. Um, and organisms are going to interact with both biotic and abiotic. Um, in different ways, and that's going to help kind of to determine where that they live and what they what their job is in their environment, what they do in order to survive. And so, some more definitions kind of to help us get a better understanding and a baseline of, of ecology. A species or an individual. We've discussed this before, but definition of a species or an individual is a group of individuals um, of, of common ancestry that closely resemble each other and that are normal capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring and that produ production of fertile offspring is extremely important because if two organisms can't come together and produce fertile offspring um, then they're generally going to be considered different species. Uh, going from an individual if we expand on that if we build up from an individual a population on the other hand, is all of the living things of the same species uh, in a habitat or one particular area that have a chance of interbreeding. And so if we started with our individual population, is just going to be all of those individuals in the same area of the same species. Expanding further to a community, a community includes multiple populations in a particular habitat or ecosystem. Um, and there can be multiple communities in a habitat at any one time, but basically this is multiple populations, different species living together in the same area. The ecosystem then adds in those abiotic factors, and so it includes the physical and chemical environments that an organism uh, interacts with within their habitat. Um, the biodiversity is a total number of species in an ecosystem and their relative abundance. So it's looking at how many of, of different types of species in an ecosystem and how often they occur. Now, one of the main things that, that you could classify or examine how organisms interact with each other is basically what eats what. And we call that feeding relationships. Uh, I found this comic and I thought it was kind of funny, funny um, uh, the fish trying to make a call and noticing that uh, signal is going to get a little bit weaker. Basically, all of these different fish are, are eating each other and, and this kind of goes along with, with feeding relationships. And a term that we use to describe this is something called a food chain. And this describes the transfer of energy from one organism to another. Um, 
And so what this looks like is, is basically how energy gets transferred from one organism to the next. And there can be multiple different levels within a food chain, um, but a food chain is a, is a basic system to show this transfer of energy. And here we have a couple of examples. Uh, in this first one here, the plant um, is consumed by a herbivore, and that energy gets transferred from one to the next. Um, the, the mouse here eats the herbivore, and so that energy gets transferred to the mouse. Snake eats the mouse, bird eats the snake, etc. Um, and so we can label these, uh, these at different trophic levels. This would be trophic level one, two, three, four, five. Uh, this would be a producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, quaternary consumer. In these, the arrow is pointing, the direction of the arrow is pointing to which way that energy is actually transferred or, 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 or moved. Um, and to define a trophic level, it's essentially a level at which an organism feeds in a food chain or food web. A food chain is a basic linear description of how this energy gets transferred. A food web, on the other hand, is much more complex, as we're going to see. Um, essentially, a food web is made up of multiple food chains. And here's a kind of a basic example. Sunlight is providing energy to our, um, our autotrophs, which then essentially provide energy for everything else in that ecosystem. Um, I'm going to show you a bigger one here in just a second. Um, food webs get quite a bit more complicated, and, and oftentimes it's hard to know exactly how everything is interacting with one another and what exactly is eating what. And multiple times, prey often have more than one predator. Um, and predators are going to exploit abundant food sources. So if there's a lot of one particular food source in one season, they're going to exploit that particular food source. But a food web will help us to see how these organisms are, um, how they interact with one another. And so one of the standards is to be able to deduce the trophic level of organisms in a food web. Um, so I'd like you to pause the video on the screen and to, by looking at these organisms and the flow of energy, see if you can figure out and, and write down the trophic levels for some of these. Start with a, uh, with, a, with a producer and go from there. And we'll do a couple examples here in a second. So let's see if we can look at some of these and, and figure out some trophic levels here. Um, Arctic willow, let's start with that. Arctic willow is a producer, and so it's going to provide energy to a number of different organisms here. Um, and the first one that it provides energy, energy to is the Arctic hare. So I'm going to give the Arctic willow a 1, because that's going to be trophic level 1. And in this case, the hare is going to be a 2. Now, obviously, there's a variety of different things that are going to eat the Arctic hare, and the hare gets energy from a number of different things. And so when you're assigning trophic levels, it's really dependent on which food chain within the food web you're looking at and so it can it, it can change a little bit and be a little bit more um, it can be a little bit different um, let's say that we look at the snowy owl that eats the arctic hare the snowy owl is going to be trophic level three in the case that the arctic wolf eats the snowy owl the wolf is going to be a four trophic level four and humans in this case would be a trophic level five uh, so if you were to look at it in a di uh, in a different direction um, Let's say if you, uh, the Arctic wolf ate the hare, the wolf in that case would be a three, and then the hunter would be a four. So it's really dependent on what interactions that you're looking at. A couple of, of key things that you need to be able to state. One, sunlight is the initial energy source for almost all communities. Sunlight is providing that initial energy source, which then provides energy to producers in order to carry out photosynthesis. Secondly, energy transformation, so the transfer of energy from one food level to the next, is never 100% efficient, and it's actually, actually extremely inefficient, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and lastly, saprotrophic bacteria and fungi recycle nutrients, and so they help to break down things that are dead within the ecosystem and release the nutrients within them back into the soil. In looking at the, um, the bigger kind of topics for this, for this standard, um, energy flow is, is one of the first ones, and being able to explain the flow of energy through an ecosystem. Um, energy moves through an ecosystem, and that energy is generally provided by suns, uh, the sun, excuse me, <laughs> uh, and, and so that energy gets transferred from producers to consumers um, and different levels of consumers, and energy is going to move through the ecosystem from one form to the next. Autotrophs transfer that light energy and, and convert it into a form of chemical energy that can then be consumed by a different organism. Um, energy is going to be lost by uh, either heat, respiration, or metabolism. Uh, sometimes a little bit of it is lost is also in um, uh, waste, uh, feces, 
um, and also in movement, um, and, and we'll look at that in detail a little bit more. Um, so sun provides energy to producers. Uh, those producers create organic uh, molecules that can be consumed, and so that energy gets transferred to consumers. Uh, as those consumers carry out their daily activities and, and respirate and metabolism, um, energy is going to be lost. When these organisms die, they uh, essentially start to decay and decomposers help to break them down and release nutrients back into the ecosystem. And so we kind of have a cycle of nutrients, which, is, which are the biogeochemical cycles, and we also have a transfer of energy. And we'll look at the biogeochemicals a little bit more later. Consumers obtain energy by eating other consumers and the death of an organism passes energy uh, to detrivores and sapotrophs, which uh, when dead matter decays. And so those two help to break down the energy and re-release it back into the environment. Um, if we look more specifically at energy flow, here's a nice, nice simple diagram. Uh, the sun's providing energy to producers. Producers and consumers are losing some of that energy as heat. Um, consumers consume producers and the energy is transferred to them. Consumers once they die or when producers die, transfer energy to decomposers, which also do lose some energy as heat, and um, inorganic nutrients, those, those nutrients um, like phosphorus and nitrogen and carbon get recycled back into the ecosystem. The thing to remember with all of this is that energy transfer is never efficient, uh, completely 100% efficient, and actually only 10% of the energy gets transferred from one level to the next. So each time you move up a food chain or a food pyramid, only t about 10% of that energy is transferred. Um, a couple of things that result from this. One, energy lost um, through this process is the reason why food chains are so short. There, uh, few transfers of energy can be sustained because so much energy is lost at each level. And so a lot of times we only see maybe a third level consumer at the most, or a fourth level consumer, a fifth level consumer is very rare. Um, feeding relationships can be structured like a pyramid where there's a large amount of individuals on the bottom and fewer and fewer individuals up, uh, moving up the pyramid. Um, not all food can be digested. It'd be kind of our third topic here. Not all food can be digested, and so some of it's actually just going to be lost as waste. And not all organisms at each trophic level are eaten. Actually, some will not transfer their energy. And so um, this flow of energy, the key things to remember, it's not 100% efficient. It's very far from that. Only about 10% of energy is transferred. A good deal of it is lost to the reasons that we've discussed. Let's take a closer look at energy pyramids. Uh, there's a couple different types of pyramids, uh, numbers, biomass, and energy. And these three different types kind of have produced uh, some different types of pyramids. A pyramid of numbers is essentially based off of the creation, uh, creating a pyramid, like these right here, based off of the number of, an, of organisms. Um, but the problem with it, it makes no allowance for the difference in size of individual organisms. And so, for example, like an oak tree, a huge oak tree would be counted the same in terms of numbers as a single bacteria or a single algae cell. Um, and so that, that kind of creates some problems um, in terms of looking at the overall size of it. Uh, secondly, pyramids could be made based off of biomass. Um, and so this would be estimating the number of organisms and then finding the biomass of a sample and calculating the overall biomass. Um, the problem with this is that it represents matter in different organisms, but it doesn't compensate for the speed of matter consumed. And so this also kind of results in some of discrepancies if you compare different, uh, different food pyramids. The last one, the, the more commonly accepted form, is energy pyramids. And this pyramid is based on the inflow of energy to each trophic level, so how much energy is actually coming into it, uh, into that particular trophic level. And this is the preferred uh, form of an energy pyramid and the one that you will generally see. Um, lastly, we want to talk about uh, plants and, excuse me, nutrients uh, being recycled. Energy enters and leaves ecosystems systems and nutrients are recycled. These biogeochemical cycles that we'll look at in more detail later um, is a process by which essential elements, nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, and water are reused and recycled. Um, consumers get a lot of their nutrients by consuming plants or other consumers. So plants, producers are providing um, these organic molecules um, by absorbing CO2 and, and uh, minerals from the soil. Um, consumers come along and eat those plants and so they're consuming that energy. Uh, the death of an organism results in the re-release of the nutrients in those organisms, either producers or consumers, and decomposers, um, bacteria, fungi, are going to re-release those nutrients back into the soil. 
detrovores and saptrophs break down dead organisms into simpler substances, um, and they're extremely important uh, to the overall cycle of the ecosystems.